I'm Alex Tarrant from interest.co.nz and welcome to another one of our talks with uh, the finance heads of the major parties. We've got James Shaw from the Green Party today on a windy uh, Wellington day. Um, thanks for your time, James, busy in the campaign. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, more than welcome. And it's good to get a chance to talk about finance and economics because actually in the campaign, weirdly, uh, it hasn't come up all that much. Oh, I think tax monetary policy should be what everyone's asking about um, all the time. So I just want to delve in. I've been reading through the um, the economic policy yep. that you guys have put up. Yep. Pretty substantial document. I've got to yep. give you guys credit for your policy documents, um, I think. And a few people, well, on the website, <coughs> uh, I was interested to see under income tax, there are two lines on it, yep. so, which, which were introducing a tax-free threshold yes. and reducing and simplifying rates in the middle bands and passing on tax cuts to beneficiaries and adjusting abatement rates. And I got all yeah. excited. I thought maybe the Green Party's dropped its top income tax rate, but then you actually read through the document yeah. and, um, and, and it is there. So you're talking about tax-free thresholds, pretty simple thing, and, yeah. but simplifying those middle income tax bands. Have you sort of got an idea of, of the numbers? No, that, that well, what we've said, so, that, so the, the policy that you would have been reading on the website is our kind of, um, directional policy, if you like, and then each, each election, uh, what we do is we come up with specific proposals that are costed and time bound for this electoral cycle, which are in line with that policy. So what we've said at this election is that there would be two changes to income taxes. Um, one is, as you said, the introduction of a new top tax rate on earnings above one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So okay. you'd be paying on every dollar above one hundred and fifty, you'd be paying an additional seven cents tax. Okay. Uh, and also that we would lower the bottom threshold, the first fourteen thousand, from ten and a half percent to nine percent. Okay. Right. So literally everyone in the country, well, ninety-seven percent of people in the country, uh, end up about two hundred and ten dollars a year better off okay. with that. Um, but then people on one hundred and fifty pay a, a bit steeper rate on so that. So the tax-free threshold is, is more an ambition. Yeah, that's right. On. That's okay. right. So one, I mean, we actually did. Uh, I don't know if you remember in the twenty fourteen election, we introduced a tax. Uh, free band on the first 2000. Okay. What we decided to do this time was simply to lower the, the that rate on the bottom threshold rather than add an additional tax free band. Okay. <coughs> I mean, obviously, we've got the MOU with Labour yeah. and stuff like that. Are you concerned at all by Jacinda Ardern ruling out raising the, the top income tax band, or that's all just after September? That's a, that, yeah, it is, and that's where we have to sit down and, I mean, that's coalition negotiations, right? Every party goes into the election with their own policy platforms, uh, and then we see what the relative numbers are, and if we can get a majority or, or if we can persuade them, then, then we would. There are certainly, I mean, I've supported Grant uh, in that proposal to have a tax working group, because I do think uh, I mean, they had, it's been about 10 years since the last one, but also um, the, the uh, remit of what they're talking about is quite broad. So they're looking at tax, income, uh, welfare, you know, like the whole... Income, assets and yeah, wealth. Precise, yeah, right, that's right. Yeah. A much broader kind well, of... They keep ruling things out now, so it's... Well, yeah. <laughs> well, the, um, the, it's certainly in, the, in their first term, right? But of course... The whole point is to kind of get that group to take a look and then you go into the election, the subsequent election, yeah. and say, okay, these are the recommendations, this is what we'd like to do, and then you go to the country. But we've got a real sense of urgency about two things, one of which is the housing crisis mm -hmm. uh, and the other of which is climate change. Yep. Um, and so I think that a proper price on emissions and a capital gains tax okay. would be two things that I might be able to persuade them to do in our first term rather than to wait for a, yeah. that working group. So, but when it comes to housing, we've got we've already got the <coughs> right line test, which yeah. they're going to expand from two years to five years. So that covers yeah. the first term. And both your policies yeah. and their policies exclude the family home, which is two thirds of residential property. Yeah. So isn't that... Although it's 50% of all new sales, of all sales. Okay. Right, so more, more than half of all property sales are going to uh, investors rather than to owner occupiers. Okay, right. So the proportion of uh, residential um, of owner occupiers is shrinking dramatically, right? And so the modelling that we're seeing is that the capital gain component is actually increasing. Sure. Yeah. But does it still not create an incentive for people to invest in their own home to make them bigger, to build bigger and bigger homes? Yeah, there's uh, certainly. There, yeah, there is certainly 
that component of it which uh, you know which we need to be cognizant of. So it's not it's not perfect, right? And I've, I've never said that it is. Okay. Yeah. So that distortion sort of stays there or could stay there. Uh, well, it could, yes, um, unless you look at other mitigating uh, responses. I mean, most countries in the world that have got a capital gains tax do exclude the family home. Very few of them do it on the family home as well. Um, and so the way that we're looking at it is to say, well, it's on investments right? Okay. Um, and on, on investment properties. But ours would be comprehensive so that it would apply to all asset classes. Because yep. the advice that I, and, and for me, this is not a revenue grab, right? To me, it's actually, if we, if we had zero revenue out of it, it would be fine. The whole point is to try and correct the imbalance in the economy and to take the heat out of all the overemphasis on property and investment, particularly at the speculative end, and to redirect capital towards the productive part of the economy. Okay, but, but I mean, owner-occupied housing isn't a productive part of the economy. No, it's not. Um, but the point is, is that at the moment, you've got this massive speculative boom in property and we want to be redirecting some of that capital away from that and back into okay. businesses, for example. Sure. Another way, another thing that's been uh, touted by um, the economist Andrew Coleman is uh, instead of capital gains tax or imputed rents, which yeah. are politically very hard to impose, yeah. um, that we change the way we look at savings and how savings are taxed. Yeah. Is this in broad sort of sense, is, is that something you guys could look at? You think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm quite persuaded by Andrew's argument that um, taxing uh, superannuation on the way out rather than on the way in has an impact on whether people put their money into property or, or into um, the share market okay, via, sure. via yep. you know, um, um, superannuation funds, yep. for example. Um, I'm not completely persuaded yet, and, and this is only because I you know, haven't engaged with it heavily yet, on whether that would eliminate the need for a capital gains tax. Okay. I'm not, you know, or, or if it's just shifting the savings. But I, I mean, having lived in the UK for a long time, yep. as did you, yep. um, I know that it was a massive incentive to save was instead of taxing on the way in, you tax on okay. the way out. And the only reason why New Zealand switched is because the government was running out of money yeah, we in nineteen ninety nine and, and decided to um, to switch it around. And I, I think that's quite a poor basis for policy making. Okay. And You've got a KiwiSaver policy uh, yep. as well, the Green Party. What's your view on compulsory KiwiSaver? I wasn't able to really. Yeah. Find that. So, uh, well, currently not 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 in favour of it, but um, you know, again, sympathetic to the arguments uh, that that we may need to move in that direction eventually. But I think if you look at the um, uh, the Cullen Fund, the superannuation fund, uh, that's our that's frankly our highest priority is to restart payments into that now that we're starting to run surplus. And you also want them to run a default <coughs> KiwiSaver fund, is that right? Yes. So that idea um, is simply to say, well, there's a lot of um, it is essentially to, if you had that public option uh, where it, you know it's obviously got to be um, profitable, but you know, where that's not the primary motivator, then it puts downward pressure on the rest of the market in terms of the fees, um, because there are quite high fees in, across the whole KiwiSaver sector. Yep. And I know that some providers are starting to respond to that, but when you've got a small market, it makes it pretty easy just, you know, for that price to kind of settle higher rather than to settle lower. Sure. Um, and so the idea there is really just to stimulate competition. In the same way that KiwiBank provided competition yep. on bank fees, uh, sure. We'll get on a queue back yeah. in, a, in, a, in a second. Yeah. Um, one thing that uh, interest.co.nz is very keen on is monetary policy. <laughs> um, no one else is for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Total audience, 500 people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, I'm really interested, though, in the... Obviously, we've got Labor's proposals. Yeah. In your proposal, you're talking about greater interaction between monetary and fiscal policy, which, to me, sounds like... like are we talking about the finance minister having a say... No monetary policy. No. How do you envisage no. that happening? No. Well, I mean, I have to say, at this election, there's really. Um, I mean, we haven't emphasised that at this election. The things that we're most concerned about when it comes to monetary policy are, um, you know, we have a strong preference to uh, have a board rather than a single decision maker. That sounds like it's going to happen, no matter what the government. Yeah, prob it probably. It probably will. And I, you know, I mean, I obviously recognise that you know the governor currently takes advice and and so on. But I, I think I think that. And not like Australia, where it tends to um, get pulled in all sorts of different directions. You have a view on how, because I think Labor wants a, quite a few external people on that board. Yeah, whereas I, I think Stephen Joyce is leaning towards the current setup of the governor, the assistants, the deputy. And yeah, the chief, no, we've we have said that it would be good to have some external stakeholders in that to be able to 
uh, provide, um, I guess, a more grounded view of the economy and, yeah. and kind of in, in its real terms. Um, um, but I, I'd be, I'm, I'm also aware of the lessons learned from Australia where a kind of a large and externally dominated committee tends to um, uh, kind of pull up in directions that aren't always helpful, right? Okay. So, so uh, I, I just think there's got to be a balance that's got to be struck. Okay. And I mean, you say you're not putting much emphasis on it, this election, but another part of the, the monetary policy proposal, Reserve Bank proposal, was uh, currency intervention, exchange rate. Um, targeting, yeah. it's not, just not a big thing this no, time around? No, it's not. Okay. No, it's not. And I'm, I'm reasonably happy with where things are going in monetary policy okay. at the moment. I, I, I think I actually think that the Reserve Bank does a, a pretty good mm -hmm. job. <laughs> okay. Um, there is one other thing that we have said that we would like to see, which is um, uh, um, deposit insurance. Yep, sure. And... Uh, I've tried to push that with Stephen Joyce and he's not really interested um, and the Reserve Bank have pushed back on that yeah. proposal as well. And Let's talk about moral hazard though, isn't it? Well they do talk about moral hazard but actually if you look at the evidence from overseas it doesn't really seem to introduce it mm -hmm. um, and that's partially because people don't, uh, you know when they're making choices about which banks, um, they're not actually making decisions based on that level of sophisticated understanding of, uh, sure. of where the bank is at. Um, but we are now the only OECD country that doesn't have deposit okay. insurance. And so you'd yeah. look at what, 10,000, 20,000? Oh, actually, yeah, uh, 50, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. 50 to 100. All but right. I, I mean, I'd, I'd take advice on that. I think Australia's is really high. It's like a quarter of a million or something. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, th I think, I mean, the thing is that, of course, the vast majority of Kiwis have got less than three thousand dollars in savings anyway. Sure. Right. So if you set it at a hundred thousand, actually, the number of people whom that would cover would actually be quite small. Yeah. Because yeah. very few of us have got a hundred thousand dollars sitting in the bank. No, I don't. Yeah. Um, no. So just when you say you're not, you're actually quite happy with how much policy is going. At the Broadly moment. speaking, this talk of, of yeah. different instruments or different targets than inflation, because I think nominal GDP is is yeah. popped up. So that's not really going to be a focus. It not no, not for us. No. I mean, I, I just think. You know, we've got our priorities for this election, uh, and, you know, as I keep banging on, it's about making New Zealand the world leader against in the fight against climate change, it's about cleaning up our rivers, and it's about um, ending child poverty. And so if you look at, look at it that way, well, obviously there's an interaction with monetary and obviously with fiscal policy. I've had more, you know, kind of fiscal policy, you know, the stuff that yep. we did with Grant earlier in the year, yep. that's really been my focus. Okay. But, so we're not going to get... Yeah, so we're not going to get monetary policy, fiscal policy meshed up again no. like we had in the 70s. No. All right. Okay. Kiwi Bank, you've got an interesting proposal here. Yeah. Um, for to I think mandate or at least push Kiwi Bank to pass on changes in the OCR. Uh, um, no, it's more. That, so what? This is more that um, Kiwi Bank does pass on uh, changes in the OCR because of its domestic nature. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the other mainstream banks are largely borrowing offshore um, because they don't have the deposit base inside New Zealand that, that Kiwi Bank does. Um, and so when the OCR gets cut, uh, Kiwi Bank tends to reduce its rate and the other banks tend not to reduce it by quite as much. Right? Um, and so one of the reasons why I was hoping that, um, I mean our proposal around Kiwi Bank was to uh, recapitalise it but to keep it fully in public ownership. Is there a problem now that the super there fund is, and ACC have that? Yes. Like the, well, the, n not immediately, but there will be in four and a half years' time. Because uh, the um, super fund, they'll put money into it, mm -hmm. they'll capitalise it, it'll grow, mm -hmm. it'll improve, uh, and then, um, as a fund manager, uh, whose job it is to make sure that New Zealand has got the maximum amount in the pot for retirement savings, their mandate uh, is to... Um, get a return on that investment. So what do they do? Do they sell it off uh, or do they keep it? Would you lock them in there? Perhaps? Well, uh, the problem is the deal's been done, mm. right? And they've got, they've, got to, they've got to sell it back to the, 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 sorry, they've got to offer it back to the yeah, government. Yeah, first refusal, right? So. Yeah, but here's the thing. In five years' time, it'll be worth two or three or four times, I mean, you've got to remember, they bought it for half price. Sure. So even if they were to sell it back one for one, it'll it'll be worth at least four times what they yeah. bought it for. So you've got no, a bit of thinking to do on that. Well, any future finance minister is going to look at that and go, <coughs> that's quite a lot of cash mm -hmm. for a bank. And I think that it's worth more as a strategic asset. You've got to remember, you know, during the GFC, 
uh, all of the Aussie banks were repatriating cash back to Australia, right, which they had to do. Yep. Um, but that left New Zealand businesses unable to get credit. Kiwi Bank kept lending into the market, right? With the SMEs, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the SMEs are 98% yeah, yeah. of New Zealand businesses, <laughs> so, you know, it's pretty important that they yep. um, keep going. And 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 so uh, if that if if we were to ultimately sell Kiwi Bank and it was just like any other commercial bank, probably again owned primarily offshore, then we wouldn't be able to. It wouldn't serve that strategic yeah. um, so line of defence the way that it did during the GFC. So the policy you've got on Kiwi Bank of pumping, I think it's a hundred million extra into it and mandate or yeah. trying to formalise OCR passing on. Funding cost things. No, like, it's yeah. I, it's all made more difficult now. Yeah. Well, it's well. You can't really do it. Okay. Because the government no longer owns it directly. Okay. Um. That. So, but that would that would have been our preference, right? Was to, was to it was it was actually the priority was to commercialise it, right? Yep. So, uh, so, sorry to make sure that it was because uh, it was commercialised. Is that it was um the hundred million dollars would have been able to scale it up to the point where it was a commercial bank, not just a retail bank. Okay. Um, and then it would have been able to do other things, such as uh, take over the government banking contracts, okay. which it can't currently do because it doesn't have the scale or the operational um, okay. ability to do that. Um, and so that, that was where we wanted to take it, but we wanted to keep it in um, full public ownership because, because of the um, strategic uh, advantage mm -hmm. that, it, that it has. Yep. You move it off into the private market, we no longer have um, something that, that gives us that insurance. Okay. So just looking generally now, you've sort of you've regrouped. Yep. Um, after the last few months, uh, you're talking about climate change a lot more. You're I am talking about clean rivers a lot more. Are you worried though that Labor has come in on some of those areas? Child poverty. You know, we've got Jacinda Ardern and Bill English now. Um, yeah. Talking that about was a it. turn for the books. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, have like. Why vote for the Green Party still if everyone yeah. else is sort of coming in onto your patch? Well, because, um, you know, there's a saying in Texas, all hat and no cattle, okay. right? Um, <laughs> if you look at... Uh, so it's good that other people are starting to use the rhetoric, but if you scratch the surface, then they're still just poking at the problem rather than doing the things that they're committed to. So Labour, you know, we've said on climate change, for example, that uh, we want New Zealand to commit to the target of being a net zero emission economy by the year 2050. We would pass a law in our first 100 days in government that set that target mm -hmm. and then created the Independent Climate Commission to work out pathways to get there and obliged all future governments to set policy Which in line they have set as well though, right? No. In terms of no, legislation? They Are they no, not they in favour of the legislation? They're in favour of the legislation but they haven't committed to a target or a date. Okay. Right? Alright. Which is the kind of, that's the first step. Okay. What's the target? What's the date? Um, and if you've got a child poverty, well, you know, it's all very good for Bill English to say that he wants to lift 100,000 kids out of poverty, which, by the way, was our target in 2011 and in 2014. Um, but his own uh, policy doesn't actually achieve that. Right? Okay. So, um, you know, you've got to be able to back up. But you're not going to be there holding him to account because there's still that refusal to entertain that. Well, I don't think we're going to have to because. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to be in government, and he's not. <laughs> Have you got an eye on eye on any sort of cabinet position? Yes. Which is? <laughs> I'm not telling. No, but if you again, like if you look at the priorities that we've got, right? Um, climate change, uh, um, cleaning up our rivers, uh, you know, um, eliminating poverty. Then you look at the portfolios that are necessary towards yep. doing that, right? And in, in terms of our climate plan, you've got um, what are the things that are going to make that happen? Well, there's the climate change job itself, mm -hmm. but actually the Minister for Climate Change can't um, actually solve the problem because if you look at where our emissions come from, they come from agriculture, from transport, from energy, from building okay. and construction, uh, from waste actually, yeah. um, and so there's a whole swag of uh, different things there where you've got intervention points. So we won't go into the agriculture stuff because I've interviewed Eugenie on it um, sure. already. Um, okay, so a vote for the Greens would be a vote for... Oh, a vote for the Greens is a vote for a government that has climate change, clean rivers, and an end to poverty at the top of the political agenda, not just, you know, mm -hmm. when we get to it, not just up to everything. And that's not time. making any of these sort of nitty gritty policies bottom lines, really. You've got sort of highbrow ideas rather than. 
rather than what Winston Peters says is his bottom line. Oh, he's, I don't know how many bottom lines. I mean, one of his bottom lines is recarpeting the beehive. I mean, it's, you know. Um, <laughs> That's pretty poor, though. Yeah, it is. I mean, the thing is, so, um, you know, I've, I've said what our top three priorities are, um, and uh, we want to make sure that, you know, those are at the top of the agenda for the next Labour lead government, um, of which we intend to be a core part. Okay, well, good luck. Yeah, thanks Thank very you. much. Oh, well, that's James Shaw. He's the co-leader of the Green Party, the only leader of the Green Party at the moment. And there was another one in our series of uh, interviews with the finance bigwigs. We had Stephen Joyce, and we're also going to have Grant Robertson. So thanks again, James. I'm Alex Tarrant for interest.co.nz.